We have saved for the last this problem. What if police or judges and courts should be venal and biased? What if they should bias their decisions, for example, in favor of particularly wealthy clients? We have shown how a libertarian legal and judicial system could work on the purely free market, assuming honest differences of opinion. But what if one or more police or courts should become, in effect, outlaws? What then? In the first place, libertarians do not flinch from such a question. In contrast to such utopians as Marxists or left-wing anarchists, anarcho-communists or anarcho-syndicalists, libertarians do not assume that the ushering in of the purely free society of their dreams will also bring with it a new, magically transformed libertarian man. We do not assume that the lion will lie down with the lamb, or that no one will have criminal or fraudulent designs upon his neighbor. The better that people will be, of course, the better any social system will work. In particular, the less work any police or courts will have to do. But no such assumption is made by libertarians. What we assert is that given any particular degree of goodness or badness among men, the purely libertarian society will be at once the most moral and the most efficient, the least criminal and the most secure of person or property. Let us first consider the problem of the venal or crooked judge or court. What of the court which favors its own wealthy client in trouble? In the first place, any such favoritism will be highly unlikely, given the rewards and sanctions of the free market economy. The very life of the court, the very livelihood of a judge, will depend on his reputation for integrity, fair-mindedness, objectivity, and the quest for truth in every case. This is his brand name. Should word of any venality leak out, he will immediately lose clients, and the courts will no longer have customers. For even those clients who may be criminally inclined will scarcely sponsor a court whose decisions are no longer taken seriously by the rest of society, or who themselves may well be in jail for dishonest and fraudulent dealings. If, for example, Joe Zilch is accused of a crime or breach of contract, and he goes to a court headed by his brother-in-law, no one, least of all other honest courts, will take this court's decision seriously. It will no longer be considered a court in the eyes of anyone but Joe Zilch and his family. Contrast this built-in corrective mechanism to the present-day government courts. Judges are appointed or elected for long terms, up to life, and they are accorded a monopoly of decision-making in their particular area. It is almost impossible, except in cases of gross corruption, to do anything about venal decisions of judges. Their power to make and to enforce their decisions continues unchecked year after year. Their salaries continue to be paid, furnished under coercion by the hapless taxpayer. But in the totally free society, any suspicion of a judge or court will cause their customers to melt away and their decisions to be ignored. This is a far more efficient system of keeping judges honest than the mechanism of government. Furthermore, the temptation for venality and bias would be far less for another reason. Business firms in the free market earn their keep, not from wealthy customers, but from a mass market by consumers. Macy's earns its income from the mass of the population, not from a few wealthy customers. The same is true of metropolitan life insurance today, and the same would be true of any metropolitan court system tomorrow. It would be folly indeed for the courts to risk the loss of favor by the bulk of its customers, for the favors of a few wealthy clients. But contrast the present system, where judges, like all other politicians, may be beholden to wealthy contributors who finance the campaigns of their political parties. There is a myth that the American system provides a superb set of checks and balances, with the executive, the legislature, and the courts all balancing and checking one against the other, so that power cannot unduly accumulate in one set of hands. But the American checks and balances system is largely a fraud. For each one of these institutions is a coercive monopoly in its area, 
and all of them are part of one government, headed by one political party at any given time. Furthermore, at best there are only two parties, each one close to the other in ideology and personnel, often colluding, and the actual day-to-day -day business of government is headed by a civil service bureaucracy that cannot be displaced by the voters. Contrast to these mythical checks and balances, the real checks and balances provided by the free market economy. What keeps A&P honest is the competition, actual and potential, of Safeway, Pioneer, and countless other grocery stores. What keeps them honest is the ability of the consumers to cut off their patronage. What would keep the free market judges and courts honest is the lively possibility of heading down the block or down the road to another judge or court, if suspicion should descend on any particular one. What would keep them honest is the lively possibility of their customers cutting off their business. These are the real, active checks and balances of the free market economy and the free society. The same analysis applies to the possibility of a private police force becoming outlaw, of using their coercive powers to exact tribute, set up a protection racket to shake down their victims, etc. Of course, such a thing could happen. But in contrast to present-day society, there would be immediate checks and balances available. There would be other police forces who could use their weapons to band together to put down the aggressors against their clientele. If the Metropolitan Police Force should become gangsters and exact tribute, then the rest of society could flock to the prudential, equitable, etc. police forces, who could band together to put them down. And this contrasts vividly with the state. If a group of gangsters should capture the state apparatus with its monopoly of coercive weapons, there is nothing at present that can stop them, short of the immensely difficult process of revolution. In a libertarian society, there would be no need for a massive revolution to stop the depredation of gangster states. There would be a swift turning to the honest police forces to check and put down the force that had turned bandit. And indeed, what is the state anyway but organized banditry? What is taxation but theft on a gigantic, unchecked scale? What is war but mass murder on a scale impossible by private police forces? What is conscription but mass enslavement? Can anyone envision a private police force getting away with a tiny fraction of what states get away with, and do habitually, year after year, century after century? There is another vital consideration that would make it almost impossible for an outlaw police force to commit anything like the banditry that modern governments practice. One of the crucial factors that permits governments to do the monstrous things they habitually do is the sense of legitimacy on the part of the stupefied public. The average citizen may not like, may even strongly object to, the policies and exactions of his government, but he has been imbued with the idea carefully indoctrinated by centuries of governmental propaganda that the government is his legitimate sovereign and that it would be wicked or mad to refuse to obey its dictates. It is this sense of legitimacy that the state's intellectuals have fostered over the ages, aided and abetted by all the trappings of legitimacy, flags, rituals, ceremonies, awards, constitutions, etc. A bandit gang even if all the police forces conspired together into one vast gang, could never command such legitimacy. The public would consider them purely bandits. Their extortions and tributes would never be considered legitimate, though onerous taxes to be paid automatically. The public would quickly resist these illegitimate demands, and the bandits would be resisted and overthrown. Once the public had tasted the joys, prosperity, freedom, and efficiency of a libertarian, stateless society, it would be almost impossible for a state to fasten itself upon them once again. Once freedom has been fully enjoyed, it is no easy task to force people to give it up. But suppose, just suppose, that despite all these handicaps and obstacles, despite the love for their newfound freedom, despite the inherent checks and balances of the free market, suppose anyway that the state manages to reestablish itself.
What then? Well, then, all that would have happened is that we would have a state once again. We would be no worse off than we are now with our current state. And, as one libertarian philosopher has put it, at least the world will have had a glorious holiday. Karl Marx's ringing promise applies far more to a libertarian society than to communism. In trying freedom, in abolishing the state, we have nothing to lose and everything to gain.